morning. I'm Stuart Bankhead and I'll be reading 1 John 4, 1 through 21. Uh, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Little children, you are from God and have conquered them, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may know we, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, choir. It's hard to read 1 John and not consistently be in this love theme, isn't it? I mean, from beginning to end. And that's true of John's gospel as well. So if you remember last week, we talked about the summer of love and, of course, the Beatles and all you need is love. But we had to emphasize what kind of love is the love that is all that you need. And so last week, we talked about a love that gives us a lasting identity in Jesus a love that gives life away for others, as Jesus said on the cross, a love that acts. And we emphasized last week that we are to love in truth and in action, and a love that abides, it stays, it doesn't come and go, it's not fleeting, but it endures. Well, we were in 1967 in the summer of love last week. This week, I want to jump to 1985. Has anyone seen Back to the Future? I'm trusting everybody's seen this movie, Back to the Future, right? The, the theme song of Back to the Future is the power of love, right? Bonus points if you know who sings that song. Who sings the power of love? Huey Lewis and the News. It's a wonderful, wonderful song. And in that song, the power of love is a curious thing, right? It makes a one man weep. It makes another man sing, It'll change a hawk into a little white dove, right? The power of love can make a bad one good. The power of love can make a wrong one right. The power of love can keep you home at night. And I think what Huey Lewis is there saying, instead of being out doing something you shouldn't be doing, 
the power of love will keep you where you need to be. The gist of the song is that love causes things to happen. Love can cause people to change. Love can help you grow when you love. And when you are loved, it causes what? I mean, love can cause you to do crazy things, right? I mean, love can cause you to do something you never thought you could do, like the skinny kid balling up his fist and punching Biff in the face, right? Getting the bully knocked down and changing the direction of his life and winning the girl. Love can cause you to move halfway across the country. Maybe love can cause you to give up your fins and take on legs and give up your voice, A little nod to the little mermaid there as well. Love can cause you to do some crazy things. So as we're talking about music here, hopefully now you're thinking about the band Queen and their classic song, The Crazy Little Thing Called Love. In 1 John chapter 4, in the whole letter as we've seen, the love in view here is not a crazy little thing. It's a crazy huge thing that has changed the world. And once again, this love is set before us in the text as a call for us to keep changing, a call that keeps shaping us in the image of the one who loves. And again, we're saying the word love. Saying the word love in English always invites a little clarification. It needs other words around it to emphasize what's the kind of love we're talking about here. And ultimately, I think it cries out for demonstration. Show me what love is. When you say love, what is it you mean? Show me what you mean. Tell me, yes, but show me so I can see it. Show me so that I can attach the word love to actual actions in your life that inspire me, that help me feel love, right? It's okay to want to feel what we talk about when we talk about love, And then further still, our text this morning, we're now saying God, and we're saying love, and very often when I have those two words in the same sentence, I'm humbly having to admit that I may just be talking about things that are beyond us, (laughs) right? There may just be more than we can really grasp if we're talking about God and we're talking about love, because what in the world can 1 John mean when it says, for God is love? God is love. Twice in this text, God is love. Somehow those two words belong so tightly together that it is as if they're one and the same. God is love. Do y'all remember the story of Moses meeting God in the bush? It was on fire, but the fire wasn't consuming the bush. Moses in the wilderness turned aside and said, let me see this thing that seems impossible, a bush that is burning, but it's not burning up. And then in looking at that impossible bush, the impossible happens, and God speaks to Moses, calls Moses to go back to Egypt to free the Hebrew people from their enslavement in Egypt. And part of that conversation there at the bush included Moses asking for some clarification about God, asking for a name. If I go back to Egypt, God and I go back to the Hebrews and say, God has sent me to set you free, who do I tell them that it is? Who do I tell them that you are? What is your name? And by what is your name is what is your character? Who do I say that you are? And if I go to Pharaoh, God, and I say, God has sent me, you need to let the people go. Well, God, there are a lot of other gods in Egypt. So what is your name? How will you be distinguished from all the other gods that are out there? And God responded to Moses with a name. It's the name we often hear pronounced Yahweh. And that name simply means I am, or I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. That name that God gives to Moses is a name of ultimate being because God is the ground of being. God is the cause of existence. 
And that worked for Moses to go to the people, the God of our ancestors, the God whose name is Yahweh. But as you continue to read in the Old Testament, and even in a few instances before the Moses story, you'll notice in the Old Testament that there are other descriptions attached to the name of God. That it won't just be the name of God, but it'll be the name of God plus things that God has done, like God who provided, or God who is also called Jireh. Maybe you've heard it, Jehovah Jireh, in that kind of fashion, but God as Jireh, God as provider, right? Because God has provided. Or maybe God who's a name that is attached as Nisi, God who's the banner over us, like the banner that goes before an army, the banner that identifies who we are. Or maybe God in the name Rapha, which God is a healer. Maybe even Shalom, which you all mostly know that word to be recognized as peace. But it's also attached to the name of God, God the one who brings peace. God the peace giver or peacemaker. And there's several others that you may be aware of in the Old Testament where there's a descriptive word attached to the name of God because, listen, the additional words describe what God did. In order to understand who God is in the Old Testament, we see time and again God presented with names about what God did. We could even say it theologically in this way, God is what God does. God is what God does. God is provider. God is provision. God is the healer, but God is healing. God is the one who brings peace because God is peace. God is what God does. And then when you roll into the New Testament, we see the same kind of emphasis here in 1 John. So John is really reflecting a kind of Hebrew mentality, an Old Testament mentality, when he writes, God is the one who loves. God is the lover. God is love. Equating, equating the, those two words. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that God loves? How do we know that God is lover? How do we know that God is love as the text tells us? Well, as we read, God's love is revealed among us in this way. In verse 9, God sent his son that we might have life. How do we know God is love? In this is love, in verse 10, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and what? Sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God is love is a statement that you've said that. You probably memorized 1 John 4, 7, and 8 when you were a child. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God because God is love. I mean, these are, I think there's probably some songs to that, that verse out there as well. But how do we know that God is love? We trust that God is love by virtue of what God has done. In the New Testament, we trust that God is love because God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. We trust even further that God is love because we see in Jesus a love that is unmatched in the stories of the gospel, but ultimately we see that God is love through the love of Jesus at the cross. And we see a kind of love that again has changed the world and that has certainly changed us. The best things as Christians, the best things we say about God tend to be the things we say about Jesus. And when it comes to love, what can we say about Jesus? Think about the stories in the Gospels that show, not just tell, but show the love of God. Jesus loved a man with a disabled, withered hand, and he loved him enough to healing on the Sabbath. He wasn't worried about the Pharisees. In fact, he was looking for a little of that confrontation with the Pharisees, but he healed on the Sabbath. For them broke the rules because the love was the bigger matter. Jesus loved 10 lepers, healed them all, even though only one came back to say thank you. Only one came back to worship him. But he loved these 10 lepers. Jesus loved a woman who had been suffering from bleeding for years and years and years. You may remember that story. Jesus was on his way 
to heal somebody else, but he stopped the entire train of people. He stopped the whole scene, comes to a grinding halt because this woman in the tiny little bit of faith that she had reached out, touched Jesus in the hope that she would be healed. And again, Jesus stopped the whole scene, leaned down, looked her eye to eye and said, take faith or take you know, care of your daughter. Your, your faith has healed you. This love for a woman who had been bleeding. Jesus loved Zacchaeus, even as everybody else complained around him. Why is he staying with that guy? That tax collector. Everybody knows Zacchaeus is a crook. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to stay at your house tonight. Jesus loved Zacchaeus and changed his life. Jesus loved blind Bartimaeus. On his way into Jerusalem, as Bartimaeus is shouting out, Son of David, Son of David, heal me, have mercy on me. And everybody around is doing what to Bartimaeus? You remember that story? Shh, be quiet. You're nobody. Jesus doesn't have time for you. And again, Jesus stops the entire scene. Everybody with him comes to a grinding halt. Tell Bartimaeus to come here. Jesus loves the one that everybody else tries to quiet down. And ultimately, again, it's at the cross where divine love is magnified, where love is given away. Life is given away so that the world, including you and me, might come to understand, as was written here in 1 John 4, that God is love, that Jesus is love, right? That this is what love can look like, a dying Savior in a violent and difficult world God is what God does. Jesus is what Jesus does. And at the cross, we see that God in Jesus Christ is sacrificial, self-giving love. And so, friends, this Christ-centered and cross-centered love is why in the first six verses of the text that we read, Right? In the first six verses about testing the spirits and seeing if the spirits you know, confirm the gospel, at the heart of that confirmation of the Holy Spirit at work in the church is the confession that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Because Jesus Christ coming in the flesh is the enfleshment or the embodiment of God's love for the world. There were those within the church, there were those that John calls the Antichrist, right, who were saying Jesus only kind of had flesh or Jesus was only sort of human, not fully human, or Jesus was just sort of a human shell and the divine spirit was within him. And John is saying, no, the love of God is diminished in every one of those presentations of Jesus that doesn't emphasize that Jesus is God in the flesh because Jesus is God in the flesh is the love of God taking on our flesh is the love of God walking on our ground is the love of God encountering other bodies around him is the love of God that goes with a body to the cross to redeem we humanity with his body so this first six verses of 1 John 4 is the emphasis upon the body of Jesus because in the body of Jesus is found this incomparable love of God. And Jesus was God in the flesh, fully human, fully embodying the love so that we might be fully redeemed in our humanity and now the call of 1 John 4 and that we might now fully embody the love for one another. That's, that's the call of 1 John 4, isn't it? Again and again, let us love one another. Let us love one another. The call to love one another is the call to embody God's love for others as God and Jesus did for us. Now, you may have noticed this ridiculous sermon title that I have today. I don't know if you saw it in the bulletin, right? This title, Because God is Love, Because God Loves, and Since God Loves Us So Much. This is the worst sermon title ever because I couldn't decide how to narrow it down, right? And, and, And then I decided, you know what? It's my sermon. I'll title it whatever I want to. Um, Why do I need to narrow it down? Because God is love, let us love one another. Because God loves, 
Let us abide in that love, and in abiding in that love, we can extend that love to one another. Because God is love, or since God loved us so much, the author says, we also ought to love one another. It's this crazy, huge love of God that ought then to shape us to love one another. The power of love is a curious thing, Hugh Lewis said. Here we're seeing the power of divine love as a powerful thing that can, in fact, shape our lives. You know, there's a saying, and, I, and I'm sure you've heard this saying, but there's a saying about people that hurt people hurt people. Have you all heard that saying before? That The idea that those who've been hurt by others sometimes end up perpetuating that hurt on others in, in other kinds of ways. And thanks be to God for the help that is there to sort of break that cycle. But in many cases, hurt people end up in their own lives hurting other people. But I think it can be equally said and equally true that loved people love people. That people who are shaped by love can then, in fact, perpetuate that love toward others' people. And so the word of 1 John 4 is that God is love, that God has loved, that God has loved us so much, that God has sent Jesus to embody love all the way to the Christ. Therefore, what? Let us love one another. People so loved by God can love one another. While that feels like a good place to stop, I want to add one more little piece to the idea here. Because again, when we say love one another, I feel like it still needs clarification, doesn't it? Love one another needs some description. Randy, fine, love one another. Send us out here to love one another. What does that mean? What do I do? How does that actually work? Again, last week we emphasized love that gives itself away, that puts the other first, and a love that acts, the everyday simple actions for others. I hope you did your homework assignment from last week, right? And if you didn't, I'll give a little more time, and you can do it this week. One person, one simple act of love on your way home before you get home. I mentioned last week that maybe we could create some habits here, right? Maybe we could create some habits that on my way home every Sunday from church, maybe God will put one person on my mind and one simple act of love to complete before I get home. This morning, I want to emphasize what the author emphasizes in verse 18, and that, that there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, perfect being complete or whole, right? It is that perfect and complete whole love of God showered upon us, as Paul writes in Romans 5, poured into our hearts through the love demonstrated in Jesus Christ that begins to shape us. So that love casts out fear. In relationship to God, God has removed fear because he has brought us into right relationship with himself, right? We think about redemption. We now think about being in right relationship with God. Fear doesn't have a place anymore. Fear of punishment, fear of these things have been cast out, the author says. So as we begin to love one another, we can't let fear lead the way, or we can't let fear be the thing that drives us on whether we're going to love or not. So don't allow fear to condition your love for one another. Don't fear to love someone that's hard to love. And make it easy to love them, but don't fear loving them. Don't fear to love someone the world tells you you're not supposed to love. Don't fear to love a leper, Zacchaeus, or Bartimaeus, or a guy with a withered hand. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is. And if anyone else you want to love, someone with religious power tells you you shouldn't love them, it seems like what I read in the Gospels, that's probably the one Jesus would want you to love. Now, there's so much more to say here because I don't want you to fall prey to abuse. And I'm not interested in you putting yourself in a position where loving others ends up hurting you. That's not the case. I don't think that's what the text is about either, right? But we don't want to fear loving others. We don't want fear to condition whether you might or might not take the chance to love others around you, those that God has put in your path. 
And so I figure, if I make some mistakes by loving people too much, then I guess I'm just going to have to figure out a way to live with that. Right? If I make some mistakes by loving people somebody else tells me I shouldn't love or loving people too much or welcoming people in the church that somebody tells me I shouldn't welcome, I'm just going to have to find out how to live with that. And I think by the grace of God and Jesus Christ, by the God who is love, I think I'll be okay trying to figure that out. Let's pray together. God, these are words we hear in John and, and we hear them again in this letter in such a stark way that you know, to love you is to love others. If we hate brothers or sisters, we're liars. The way John writes just sets this sort of stark challenge in front of us. And God, we hear this morning yet again these lofty statements couched in such simple words as God is love. We also ought to love one another. Since you loved us so much and demonstrated that love in your son, Jesus Christ, so we ought also to love one another. God, I pray that within Temple Baptist Church that we are a place where we can practice loving one another so that as we practice with one another, we'll get better and better as we leave this space and to the relationships we're a part of all around us, we'll just get better and better at loving one another out there too. But God, ultimately we end this moment with a heart full of gratitude that you have loved us, that you have loved us so much. In the sending of your son Jesus, we see the demonstration of that love. And we humbly ask for that love to keep shaping us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.